all the people in the organization, if the CEO was sick and gone for six months, who would run the business for them? Gotcha. Of all the people on the management and leadership team, who do we really look at as that yin and yang of everybody else? That's that's what I would call it, right? So if you're a, a smaller company, maybe you've got eight employees total in the company. When everybody looks around the room, who else besides the entrepreneur are we looking to? That's kind of the second in command, right? When you've got five managers in place, who would the most important manager in the room be? We have Cameron Harold here, who is the author of several books. And we're actually here today to talk about his new book, The Second in Command, that's available for pre-order on Amazon. But if you are not familiar with Cameron's work, I just wanted to give a really high level overview. We recommend his book, Vivid Vision, all the time at the beginning of the year. If you want to get really clear on what you are building and why you're building that. Really, you don't have a business without vision, and that's going to be an amazing tool, especially this time of year. He has written Double Double for how to double your business in three years and free PR, which is another really great one. But today we are focused on helping you leverage your time as an entrepreneur. You may have heard buzzwords thrown around such as every business needs a visionary and an integrator or somebody that can think big while also having access to someone who actually can build the vision. But the problem we see so many entrepreneurs at your level do, I'm speaking to the audience here, is that you may be a visionary, but you just have no idea how to actually implement the idea. So you look to hire someone known as the chief operating officer or the second in command. And today is really all about how to make that hire and how to best support that hire in building your vision. For those that are not familiar with your work with COO Alliance and what you've done it with 1-800-GOT-JUNK, et cetera, could you just give us like a quick backstory? I was groomed as an entrepreneur. Um, I'd been an entrepreneur my entire life. In fact, you and I have a very similar story in, in many respects where we both, when we were in university, ran house painting companies. You ran one for, I'll jokingly say, the second best group. You ran it for school <laughs> sports and I, I ran it for college pro painters. But we were running very, very st- the same business with just a different brand on it. And I think that's where I really learned about entrepreneurship and building entrepreneurs We then both went on to work for the head offices of our companies and actually recruited and coached and trained franchisees. So we were coaching entrepreneurs before coaching was even a thing. So I had a lot of time around the entrepreneurial space. And in doing that, I got to understand how to help entrepreneurial companies scale, built a couple of companies that I got well known for. And then I joined my best friend, Brian. He'd been my best man at my wedding. And he had a small business, had 13 employees, and he wanted to build it out. It was called 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And I joined him as his 14th employee. And I was his chief operating officer. And we built the company. When I left six and a half years later, we went from $2 million to $106 million in revenue in six years. We go, went from 14 employees to 3,100 employees in the six years, uh, ended up with 330 locations, four countries. I was the COO for that, that growth. Left there. 15 years ago and started working behind the scenes, coaching real companies, typically 50 to 500 employees was the zone of group that I would work with. And in doing that, I started this group called the COO Alliance, which is the only network of its kind in the world for the second in command. And that's kind of how we met at a mastermind group where we were both continuing to grow our skills. I've joined a number of mastermind communities over the year, and you and I met at one about six, seven years ago, where we were there to continue growing our skills. And that's why we're here today. We connected right away because I remember being at Baby Bathwater and everyone was like, it's Cameron Harold. Oh, wow. I was like, who? And then they're like, he's the guy that did. And they gave like just a very brief background on you. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. I know him. I know of him because of our circles with the painting thing. And I just ran over and I was like, Andrew Britnell. And you're like, who is this girl? And luckily we had common ground and here we are. So. When you got to work with a, 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 a very close friend of mine who sadly has passed away, but um, Andrew Britnell, your old boss and co-worker at Student Works, he actually was my uh, my race partner in my very first half marathon that I did. He paced me to my goal and no um, yeah, we got to got to hang out together and do some runs together and we ran my my 13 mile run and hit my goal. So, Oh boy. I didn't realize he used to run. Mm. It was but great. Sorry. I bet. That anxiety has to go somewhere, right? (laughs) You've got so much experience working with businesses that are really just 
starting to get going. But what I've found when you need to take someone to that next level is they just get bogged down by, there's only so much that you can grit through mm -hmm. building a company. There's a point where you have to hire based on your natural skill set. And yeah. I find that there are three kinds of people in business. There's either what we call the the visionary, which is the big thinker that is usually if you're on that scale, you're it's really hard for you to do the day to day focus of, of building that vision out. And then on the opposite spectrum, you have the integrator, someone who's more operations focused. They may not be super strong on the vision side, but they're very strong on the implementation side. And then you have kind of that uh, middle group, which is I kind of fall a bit on the border. So depending on where you put me in a company, I'm either the visionary or I am the integrator. Um, the implementer. So when entrepreneurs look to scale, I'd love to first think of like, what is that point when someone has to start thinking of hiring to best support to grow the vision? Hey, it's interesting. I'm going I'm to speak to that, but I want to address another quick point as well of how we're so similar. You and I are a very rare breed of people that are very entrepreneurial and very COO in the same body. And I think it's because we were an entrepreneur inside of a franchise system. We were so terrified of failing that we just fucking did everything that was in the manual. We followed the systems and we realized that systems worked, simple systems worked. And if we just followed the systems and it would work. So we learned as entrepreneurs how to follow systems and use those to our advantage. And I don't think most entrepreneurs have done that. Yeah, because pre-student works, I don't know if I was more of an implementer or more of a visionary. I think that for my own business, I've always struggled with the vision side. And I've just been mm -hmm. naturally gifted as an implementer because student works develops you into a salesperson, but also a project manager. Yeah, very similar for sure. So let's speak to the visionary integrator who are, who are listening, or the visionaries that are listening right now. The very first thing that the entrepreneurial person needs to think about when they're looking to say hire that second in command, if they know they're overwhelmed or they have too much on their plate or they want more free time or they need to get more shit done or they don't know how to do a bunch of stuff, the first key role to be hiring for is an executive assistant. If you don't have an executive assistant, you are one. And the first thing to get off your plate is all of the admin jobs, all of the low priority job, all of the minimum wage jobs and get all that off your plate to free up your time so that you can work on the bigger parts of the business. The second key roles that you really need to hire for are the kind of jack of all trades, master of none. The, the people who are really good at managing lots of projects, who can get a bunch of shit done, who can say, hell yeah, I'll go for it and can just really work on a lot of stuff and they can they get stuff done for you. Don't put a COO title on that person though. Maybe it's a director of operations. Maybe it's an ops manager. Once you have a group of people working for you, maybe you're at eight to 10 employees, and you're managing people, you're going to need someone to manage some of those people for you. Again, yeah. that's not a COO. It might be a, a, a head of operations or director of ops. It's, it's certainly your second in command. But yeah. don't put a big title on a person whose compensation and roles and responsibilities don't match that title. So be, be cautious. That's why I even called the book the second in command is it could be a director of operations. It could be a general manager. It could be a VP ops, could be president, could be a COO. So the COO starts to come in when you've got real teams of solid leaders. But okay. that's really where I think everyone listening today is more at the, how do I hire an executive assistant? How do I hire an operations person? How do I figure out who can help me grow my business? For anyone listening who's like, should I go and pre-order the book? What is the book cover? Who is it for? So the idea of the, of the book, it's called, again, The Second in Command, How to Unleash the Power of Your COO. It's all for entrepreneurial organizations who are looking to leverage the time of the founder of that entrepreneur. So it's when you recognize you have too much on your plate, you don't know how to scale parts of your business, you have enough revenue coming in that you can start hiring somebody to build out parts of the business for you. And you recognize that it's almost like a divide and conquer, right? That one plus one equals three. And it teaches you how to go out and understand what you're looking for, understand how to find them, understand how to recruit them and bring them into your business, right? Because often if you're a small company, how do you recruit somebody to join a small company where there's not a lot there when their options are going work to work for other bigger companies that might have more perks. Right. How do you sell against those bigger companies? How do you recruit those key individuals? And then once you have them, how do you bring them into the organization and build a strong relationship with them? Almost like a traditional marriage where you've got a husband and wife. How do you build a strong marriage where you maybe you divide and conquer on the roles and responsibilities in the home? 
I love to cook. My wife likes cleaning. She doesn't like to cook. I get to cook. I don't even find cooking a chore. I love that I get to do it. And yeah. I like that she actually likes to tidy up and clean stuff up. It, it works better for us, right? So you find those roles in a business as well. What are the things in the business that you're great at as an entrepreneur? Maybe you're great at marketing. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're great at engineering and IT. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're good at projects and, and operations, but you need to outsource other parts of the business. So the real second command is the person that can do all the stuff that you suck at as the entrepreneur and all the stuff that drains you of energy as the entrepreneur. And if you can find the person that's good at the things that you're not and that's that loves to do the things that drain you, that's the real starting point that what you're looking for. And then the next part is where do you find them, right? So yeah. the way, way I think of it is where do really great people hang out? Well, they hang out at good companies. They're already working for great companies. Maybe they're disillusioned in the in the company or they want more visibility with the entrepreneur or they want to get deeper into the business. They want ex more experience. Yeah. So you have to think about where are they and how do you sell to them? Mm -hmm. And then think of your job posting that you're going to use to recruit them. Most of us aren't great copywriters. So you can take a job posting that you write, you can copy and paste it into a chat GPT and have an AI polish it and make it amazing and make it pop off the page. Or yeah. you can go to a copywriter and have them rewrite the, the job posting for you to make it pop off the page and really make that job posting polarize. It should push a lot of candidates away and it should pull a lot of candidates toward you. When it comes time that someone, an entrepreneur, realizes they need help and they need to make that hire, I find that there's a lot of mental blocks with going to find that person, but even releasing some of the control and trust that you need to build into a role like your second in command, because you're literally giving the keys to the castle. What are some tips or advice that you have for someone who is making that, like when a high functioning entrepreneur is making that first hire and they do have a problem with trusting that it will get done to the level they want? Think about it like dating, right? If we're in the dating world and we're dating somebody, you're getting to know them, right? You're getting to know everything about them. You're, you're, you're spending time with them, with their friends, with their family. You're, maybe you start living together, you go on trips together, and you start to understand some of the stuff that you love about them, some of the stuff that drives you crazy, and you yeah. kind of weigh out that balance of how much of the crazy is, is worth it for the good stuff, right? And you realize, yeah, there's enough good stuff there that this actually feels good. And then you really trust your gut. That's part of the interviewing for a second in command as well, is really doing enough of the work on the interview process, getting some of your other employees to interview them, doing tough reference checks on them, really getting to know as much about them as possible so that there's almost nothing left to know on day one. Mm -hmm. That once they start working with you, there's really no surprises because you've really done the tough tough interviews along the way to really get to know that person before you actually hire them. And that's, I think, where a lot of companies don't do well is they don't understand the interviewing process, something that you would be very strong at with your experience at Student Works. I think people need to learn that content of how to interview, how to hire, how to do the proper reference checks to bring that right person into the organization. So one thing I'm not super clear on it are the terms we have second in command and then we have COO. And yeah. earlier on, you were saying how there are different levels of kinds of people that you hire. You start with the executive assistant and then you hire the account manager. Then you hire maybe someone to like eventually getting up to the rung of a COO who would manage a team of eight to 12. So what is the difference in your mind between just a second in command, which seems to be more encompassing versus the COO? Yeah, the second in command is the person that is the second in charge to the CEO. So of all the people in the organization, kind of like who are the mom and dad, right? Of all the people in the organization, if the CEO is sick and gone for six months, who would run the business for them? Gotcha. Of all the people on the management and leadership team, who do we really look at as that yin and yang? Of everybody else. That's that's what I would call it, right? So if you're a, a smaller company, maybe you've got eight employees total in the company. When everybody looks around the room, who else besides the entrepreneur are we looking to? That's kind of the second in command, right? When you've got five managers in place, who would the most important manager in the room be? It's okay. usually the one that understands the different functional areas that can help bring collaboration across the team, that can help diffuse conflict, that's helping to recruit and interview and inspire different business areas. They're not just myopically focused on their own. 
What you tend to find as an organization scales from 10 to 30 to 100 employees is really strong leaders go in one of two directions. They either become very strong as a leader of their functional area or their silo, or they become very strong leaders of the other leaders in the organization as well. And that's where you really start to see the COO or that second in command percolate from. The next part of that is the the definition of the title that you give someone should be matched to their roles and responsibilities and the compensation or the money that you want to pay them. So let's use finance as an, as an example. We can have the head of our finance group in our company, the head of accounting, the head of finance, all those areas. It could be a controller or a director of finance, or a VP of finance, or a CFO. But a a C-level person, to be a true C-level person, you tend to be thinking of strategy. You tend to be thinking of cross-departmental areas. You tend to have a little bit more seasoned experience at having grown people and built out business areas and run companies. And you're probably getting paid north of 200, 250,000 to have a real C-level title. When I left 1-800-GOT-JUNK 16 years ago, and I was the COO at 1-800-GOT-JUNK, I was getting paid north of 300000 16 years ago. Yeah. So if you're a real COO today, you should be in that $300,000 plus range for sure. So it's thinking about the compensation and the roles and responsibilities. I think as a, when you go from solopreneur to your first five people to 10, mm-hmm. et cetera, it's very easy to in the beginning, just kind of throw titles around because it looks important to have your VP of sales be your one and only appointment setter. So when you hit on, you need to match the title to the role to the compensation, why is that important? It's important for a couple of reasons. One is you want to be able to recruit the right person, right? So if I have a big title like COO and I'm only paying 120,000, it's confusing to the candidates. A lot of COO candidates are looking and saying, oh, I like this. I like this. Oh, the company's too small for me. But if I, if I market it as a director of operations, you'll, you'll attract more of the director of operations people, right? So it's understanding who am I trying to attract? What am I trying to pay them? What are their roles and responsibilities? And then also not really inflating the expectations of people. When you have a big title, that tends to mean that you're going to have multiple areas reporting to you lots of layers of responsibilities, probably bigger P&L responsibility, maybe bigger budgets. But if you're a small company and you're going to be telling the person what to do, that's not a COO. A person being told what to do is often director level. A person being consulted with and, and working together and collaborating on what to do tends to be a VP. A person deciding what to do and then collaborating with the other people that are deciding tends to be C level. One of my last questions would be what would be the what is the difference between a COO and the CEO in a company? So the the CEO is the visionary, right? The CEO is the gas. You mentioned earlier in my book, Vivid Vision. If the CEO is in charge of vision, the COO is in charge of execution. And there's a famous quote by Thomas Edison who said that vision without execution is hallucination. If you're going to be a visionary, people will get tired of all the great ideas unless we start getting some of them done. The COO or the second in command is the person to get it done. So as an entrepreneur to, because I truly believe you have to hire based on skill set in terms of if you are strong in one area, you have to offset that with, you know, your weakness and hire for that. So if a entrepreneur is watching this right now and they don't actually know where they land on the spectrum of being visionary versus more operations and that may be beyond the scope of the book, but how would you help someone figure that out? Like where they land? It's, it's by doing a bit of an activity inventory. So what I like to do is sit down and pretend this is a concept from Dan Sullivan and Strategic Coach, mm-hmm. who talks about if you can look at all of the activities or all of the tasks that are on your plate, and this is applicable for any leader, but let's say that you're the entrepreneur, pretend that someone followed you around with a video camera for an entire month. Okay, so you're an entrepreneur. Kirsten's following you around with a video camera for an entire month, like Gary B. And she's she's watching you every minute of the day from the time you wake up until the time you go to bed. And everything that you do in your business world is, is videoed. And then you replay the video and you write down every single thing that you do. You write down every task, every project you're working on, every activity you're doing the day. I open email, I read emails, I reply to emails, I 
book meetings, I attend meetings, I coach people, I, you know, whatever. There yeah. might be 90, 90 things on your list. I then open up a spreadsheet and I write down every task, one task per row. So column A is just 80, 90 tasks of things that I do over the course of a month. In column B, I categorize each of those tasks in one of four ways, either I for incompetent, C for competent, E for excellent, or U for unique ability. So incompetent is I suck at it. Competent is I'm okay at it. Excellent is I'm really, really good at it, but I don't necessarily love doing it. The unique ability is the stuff that I'm really good at. I love doing it. I get fired up. I get energized. I would do it for free, except my kids have to eat. Yeah. Column C is you think about each task. And if I was to pay someone just to do that task day in and day out, what would the hourly rate be for that task? And come up with an hourly wage that you would be willing to pay someone to do every single task. Then the idea is to get all of the stuff off your plate that you're incompetent and competent at, and to get all the minimum wage jobs off your plate. That's the starting point for the entrepreneur to understand, I want to only keep my unique ability things. And how do I find somebody who's great at all the other stuff? A lot of those early stage things are executive assistant roles. Some of the other things might actually be better to be in a singular bucket that is better for a singular person who's managing a role or a business area, but not necessarily the operations. It's really the third tranche when you get to an area where there's a bunch of stuff that are, are really a bunch of different buckets, and it could be managing and leading a bunch of different business areas. That's what really starts to point to a second in command to do that for you, to free you up to do the stuff that you're amazing at that gives you energy. I like that exercise. I love when you said incompetent because I'm like, oh yeah, I do some of those. So I'll be taking some of this advice after as well. Because um, mm. I find for me, I have, it's a constant refresh because it, to me, it's about forming a habit of getting the things off my plate that I shouldn't be doing as we grow. Because some things are just easy for me to do because it takes me five minutes, but yep. five minutes compounds over the week, over the month. So yeah, and that's, that's, I think, the starting point for these entrepreneurs to realize the second thing that they have to think about is what's the return on my investment of hiring this person? You need to get at least a three to four times return for the dollars that you're spending. So if you're going to hire a $100,000 or $200,000 person, can they generate at least four hundred to $600,000 in gross margin to make it worthwhile? Yeah. Right, You have to somehow get that additional leverage to make it worthwhile. Otherwise, and like when we go back to our painting, we didn't want somebody just to paint a house and earn exactly what we were paying them. They had to make enough money that it made sense for us to be paying them so that we could have some of that more money for ourselves. And then if we could get seven, eight, 10, 12 people painting, we were making enough money that we didn't even have to ever paint, right? Otherwise, it sometimes made more sense for us just to grab a paintbrush and paint all day and save paying the person the hourly wage. But generally speaking, that's like, if you're running a smaller business per year, that's where you would be the painter because you're doing lower volume. But when you start to do three, four houses in a day, yeah. that is where you need the teams. And that's where as a, like your time as a business owner is spent on doing the outreach, doing the estimates, managing the team, et cetera. And this is, this is the real decision-making point that I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs get to. And the decision is this, how big do I want to grow this business? How much kind of, Pete, I call it the PETA factor, the pain in the ass factor, am I willing to go through to build this business out so that it's big enough to do all of these things for me? Or would I be better off being more like a freelancer doing the core one or two things I love for five different companies yeah. and kind of calling that a day? Because you can be entrepreneurial, but not don't have to be an entrepreneur. When you decide to be an entrepreneur, it's that leap, right? It's it's kind of when I decide to jump across the creek, you can't jump part way or you get a soaker. You got to jump all the way across, right? Yeah. You decide to be an entrepreneur, you got to be all in. My last question is, is there anything I should have asked you that I haven't? I guess it goes back to, you know, one of the terms that have been very popularized in the last 11, 12 years, it was by Gino Wickman who wrote the book Traction was the visionary integrator idea. They also wrote a book called Rocket Fuel about how to actually lever up that, that role of that, that integrator. The difference between what they talk about and then what becomes a true second in command is in the visionary integrator model, they almost allow the visionary to move out of the day to day. 
to, to really have someone and they almost make it sound like the visionary is a complete disaster. They're not. Entrepreneurs can be visionary and can still be good at the operations side of the business. The key is, can they get more leverage out of having that second in command who can actually help them scale so that one plus one equals three? It doesn't have to be that the visionaries have to be so incapable of running parts of the business. It's rather that they can get leverage about having someone come in, or they can have a partner or a confidant, or they can have like, there, there's other roles that that second command can play besides just being the person to get it all done for us. I have read most of Cam's books. I highly recommend you grab all of them because he's, I think you, you write really well. So it's quick and easy to get through your stuff while also taking action on the thing. So I love the bite-sized information you give, but we're here because the book, sec The Second in Command is available on Amazon. What date is it? It's available for pre-order now, but when is it getting released? Yeah, January 24th. So everybody who's listening will be able to grab it. It's available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. Um, it is a fantastic, of all my six books, I would say this is actually now the strongest by a long shot. Um, I put a lot of work and it's because I have a lot of domain expertise now in the second command space that most businesses don't have access to. Yeah. I run the CEO Alliance. I have a podcast called the second in command podcast where I've interviewed 245 COOs of brands that we all know. Yeah. Um, so I, I've tried to take that and distill it down and give, as you say, very bite-sized, very easy to implement systems to do this. I, I try to take the bewilderment out of hiring that second in command. Yeah. And it was funny because as I like, as I know, you've been running COO Alliance for a long time now, and you've got a great membership. You've got some awesome brands that are in there are like businesses that are in there. And so I was just thinking to myself, wow, why wasn't this book out like two, three years ago? But I think it's just a matter of, well, I don't know, but it I'm glad a, you finally took this out. Thank you. Yeah. It was a timing thing for me where I, I kind of started to have an inkling for it. And then I realized I just, it's time to push this thing out. So strategically yeah. it makes sense for me but also i had the time and i also had enough really good members i included probably 50 segments in the book from coo alliance members and probably another 25 or 30 segments of the book are from second in command podcast guests so right. i took a lot of their content expertise and tried to deliver it in a way that's very systemizable that we can all execute on now i didn't want it to be a fluff piece at all yeah for sure well your books are not fluff pieces mm -hmm. So, but anyway, thank you so much. And uh, is there, do you have any parting words? My only parting word, and I try to do this anytime I speak with the media, is to remember that none of this actually matters. This is just what we do to make money, that at the end of the day, it's more about having fun, enjoying the journey, holding hands when we cross the street, you know, re remembering that we're all going to die. And this is just what we're doing to make a buck. So enjoy the journey, be there to support each other and, um, and, and yeah, have fun while we're doing it.